would take your Bibles and open them up with me, we're in Exodus 23. Exodus 23, we're going along still, this is our last chapter, talking about various uh, laws that were going to be given to these judges. If you'll remember back when Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, came to him and said, hey, you've got to uh, start giving some authority to other people. You've got to uh, have help. You can't continue to do this all on your own. Well, the trouble that comes along with that is Moses had a direct face-to-face -face relationship with God. So if he's going to delegate this authority to other people, they're going to have to have concrete standards written out uh, that they could rule with. So that's what these laws are. Beginning in chapter 20 with God's character on display, the moral law, and then he really takes the moral law and starts fleshing it out in chapters 21 through 23. So it, again, it's just an extension of what we've already been looking at. Today we're going to look more into the laws about court, <clears throat> excuse me, court and about more about Sabbath and about feasts and then um, what God is going to promise about giving them success of getting to the promised land. God makes some promises as you read the end of chapter 23. God makes some promises that if Israel had believed what God had said, they would have been in the promised land within a year uh, rather than one whole generation having to die in the wilderness before their children went in. So as you read this, Focus in on what God, every time it says God, when God says, I will, mark it in your mind or mark it on the page. And then remember when it says what God, ex <clears throat> excuse me, expects Israel to do. It's very important because remember, the covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai was a conditional covenant, covenant not like the covenant that God made with Abraham, where God went through the sides of the cow that was split in half. That was an, an unconditional covenant. This covenant is law, showing them, trying to show them the character of God and to grow to get to know him. They're going to fail miserably at this. And all of it is pointing toward all of our need. In, it, we, in and of ourselves, we cannot please God. We need Messiah. So all of it is pointing that way. We're going to see Jesus show up uh, or being promised to show up at the end of this chapter. So as you read, uh, enjoy what God has given us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for changing our plans. And Father, thank you for putting stuff on us uh, that we don't think that we can handle and that we cannot figure out because it forces us to get on our face before you. It forces us to be humbled and to say, God, I, I, I can't do this. I, I don't know what to do. And Father, I pray that today for myself and for my brothers and sisters, that we will grow in our dependence on you today. And in order for that to happen, uh, our weakness must be made known. And so you're going to bring things in our lives today that are going to show our weakness. And my flesh hates that, Father. So today, help me to put to death the flesh and to seek you. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin in verses 1 through verse 9, talking about the court system. Remember we said these laws were given to the judges. These judges or elders were set up over the thousand, over the hundreds, over the fifties. We went through that. So it says, it's, it's very interesting that God is the one that is leading this nation. And God is truth. And so he's going to be very concerned with falsehood or lying. Remember, God is truth and Satan is the father of lies. 
And so if anything is going to reflect God's character, it's going to have to be about the truth. But God understands human fallen nature that falsehood just comes so natural to us. You don't have to sit a young child down and teach them how to lie. They seem, we seem to be able to come up with that all on our natural human nature. He says, you shall not bear a false report. Now, that sounds much like back in chapter 20, in, uh, in verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. He's just repeating that command, but now he's going to give some more scope to it. He says, do not join your hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Now, if you're focused on the truth, it always is the case that in order to find the truth, you must say, I want proof. You have two people saying opposite uh, realities. And so in uh, Deuteronomy 19.15, it's stated that the truth can be set based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So here it's say it's you can, you can understand if I'm trying to prove my point that I, even if I'm lying, I'm going to try to find two or three people to come along and lie with me, not lie down, but tell lies with me. So the idea here is when he's talking about following the crowd or follow there's going to be pressure put on people to support my story, whether it's the truth or not, because we're friends or whatever, whether I'm bribing you. And God is much more interested in people telling the truth. It doesn't matter whether they're rich, it doesn't matter whether they're poor. Nobody has any special standing. What has special standing in the court should be truth. In our own system of justice, um, Lady Justice, uh, covering her eyes, meaning justice is blind, not seeing, um, not giving partiality to the rich because I want some of their money, not giving partiality to the poor because I feel like they're victims. The point is the truth. Now, we have gotten away from that and we have tended toward uh, both sides of that, but I think human nature generally tends that way. He says, verse 2, you should not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. It, it's hard when a group of people are all saying one thing, uh, this whole vigilante justice type of thing, because pressure is put on everybody to conform. That's really what's happening in our country with uh, CRT or critical race theory right now is pressure is being put on everybody to have group think. Uh, you don't have to have group think. Um, the masses and what the majority of people think does not determine what I as a Christian think. That is not my authority. My authority is God's word and I'm going to stand on it. Will it cost me? Yes. And that's what uh, is being said here. Um, I have a poster behind me. You can't see it on the camera right now, but uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of uh, my heroes of the faith, and he said this at one time. Now, remember, he was part, he was German during World War II, and in a time where Christians remained silent about their Jewish neighbors being exterminated and being carted off to concentration camps, um, he said this, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And I think that this whole idea of just, well, maybe I'm not following the crowd, but I'm not going to say anything against the crowd because they'll come against me. I think it is our responsibility as Christians to speak truth, not to follow. Um, this gets very difficult for students, especially college students, uh, when pressure is put on them to write papers and uh, do uh, 
activities that are against what their moral belief is so that they can get a good grade. And it's very much an ethical question. Uh, are you going to do what's right or are you going to do what's going to get you a, a good grade? And so our educational system, instead of being university, like unity and diversity, a place to learn how to think, it's turning into or turned into a place to indoctrinate people toward one way of thinking. And it will be the demise of our country. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it, it clearly states that evil company will corrupt good morals. So who, I, who I'm around, I'm going to tend to want to fit in. Um, generally speaking, uh, people fit into two categories, either leaders or followers. And I think it's important for you to ask yourself, um, am I a leader or am I a follower? As Christians, we have all willingly uh, had the all go through our ear and we are willingly uh, followers. We are willing servants of God. Our choice. Go to verse 4. It says, If you meet your enemy's ox on or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. Not say, well, good riddance. Uh, the idea here is that right and wrong is not determined by how I feel about somebody. Doing right and doing wrong does not really have anything to do with the relationship that I have with someone. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And this is really in our day something that in our postmodernism uh, that we have totally almost lost. Even the thought that there is truth for you and truth for me. I mean, we can look at the same red chair and I can say that it's a blue chair and you can say that it's a purple chair and that's our truth. We, it, it gets so ridiculous that we can look at a biological male and say, well, that, that's a female. Well, no, it's, it's a male. Okay. It, and we've gotten away from truth based on what God has done. And it, then it all becomes very murky. And we lose any anchor we have for anything. Then the whole thing is up for grabs. And the only thing that can result from any of it is corruption and confusion and absolute anarchy and destruction. So if you see the donkey of one you hate, um, who hates you, lying helpless under his load... You can't just turn your head and walk the other way. You shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. Work together. Now, if it was your friend, you may not have to have a law telling you to do this. Remember, the law, again, is to show us our brokenness, show us our sin. All of us naturally would see our enemy in a, in a pickle, we might say, and kind of giggle thinking, man, he deserves that. And now here's a law for Israel saying, no, you got to go help him. Well, I don't want to help him. I don't like him. He deserves everything that he gets bad. This is what's going on. A law showing our own hearts and how much it does not uh, reflect the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Uh, verse 6. You shall not pervert the justice due to your needy brother in his dispute. So I have a friend or a brother and I'm, I want to be on his side. But I can't pervert justice because of relationships. My family relationship does not go above truth. This should, this should be true with all of our lives. Uh, what kind of crimes will I cover up? Well, I shouldn't be covering up any crime because I want to be about the truth. Well, what if my child commits a crime? What if I find uh, illegal drugs with my child? What am I going to do? Am I going to cover it up or am I going to turn him in? Well, if I love him, I'm going to turn him in because I, I want this not to progress in rebellion in his life against authority. Um, but mostly... I have found, even in Christian circles, that people choose relationships over truth almost exclusively. Here, it's revealing that this is a broken part of us. Relationships over truth does not reflect the glory of God. It says, keep far 
from a false charge. Do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. I think this is interesting, the part of innocent and righteous here. Because right here, it, it, we would say that a baby is innocent, doesn't know right from wrong yet. And so this would preclude abortion uh, and killing the young. Uh, but also, the idea of the righteous, it would really show that there was such a thing as capital punishment that was delegated to the government by God. So, um, it's not saying that you would never uh, kill anyone. You would kill them, and he's already given times when you should kill them. Okay, But you, cannot, you better make sure that you know that they're guilty of a capital crime before you put them to death. Um, otherwise, God's going to hold you guilty for me. Verse 8, you shall not take a bribe, for a, a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the just. I find it interesting here that it doesn't say that you should not go out and offer a bribe. Here, it's talking about the one who receives the bribe. The bribe. So, the bribe, the, the person who receives the bribe is the one who has the authority to make the decision. So, somebody's bribing me because I can make the decision about what needs to be done in a certain situation. Uh, so, therefore, the impetus, the pressure is on the person who has to make the decision. And so... He's saying, make sure if you're in authority and you've got to make a decision that you base it on truth, not somebody greasing your palms. And the idea of no one, people will quit offering bribes if no one receives them because you really look really bad when you offer a bribe and the person uh, has moral character and will not receive the bribe. Verse 9, you shall not oppress a stranger since you yourself know the feeling of a stranger. For you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. He's repeating this. Our last chapter, chapter 22, verse 21, almost verbatim repeats this same thing. So this is big. Jesus again talks about this in Luke chapter 10, where um, it, it's talking about who is your neighbor. Um, and it's all in the context of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the result will be to love your neighbor as yourself. And who's my neighbor? Every other human being is my neighbor. And Jesus makes that very clear with the story of the good Samaritan. Someone, a Samaritan, would have been an enemy of the man who was hurt. Yet, he did what was right in the situation, regardless of his feelings or his relationship. Now, we get to verse 10, and through 10 through 13, he's going to talk about Sabbath. And he's going to extend Sabbath. Sabbath isn't going to be just about a day of the week. It's going to be a year. Um, and more uh, instruction will come in Leviticus on this. It says, you shall sow your land for six years and gather it in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. So you're not to cultivate it, you're not to uh, plant in it, you're just to let it rest. Now, what would happen is some of the seeds, the residual parts of them would still grow up. So then it says, the needy can come, you've stored up and God's going to provide for the seventh year through all the six before. But now the needy who don't have stored up can go to the field and can get food. And you're to allow them to do that. But also uh, what's left over, the, the grazing animals can eat. Now, we also know that in horticulture, this is really needed uh, to help the nutrients stay in the soil, is to give the soil rest. Uh, what came out of this, even in Israel, uh, later on in Israel's history, they started not giving a year uh, where all the ground was fallow for a year. They would do crop rotation uh, so that um, the ground would have a rest. And um, I think that most farmers uh, 
have taken on this idea because it really helps the soil long term remain healthy and fertile. Um, you can read more about that if you want. Um, it says, you are to do the same with your vineyard and with your olive grove. Um, if you, this is going to be laid out more in Leviticus, but when you get to 2 Chronicles 36, it lays out the thought of when Israel disobeyed God in this. And, and, and just by way of understanding, they stated that everything God said they're going to do, but they didn't do any of it. Not over long periods of time. And what we're going to see is that God holds them accountable. The length of time when uh, Judah was put in exile in Babylon, 40 years, was because of how long they ignored this, this law from God. So God was holding them accountable. Look what it says in verse 12. Six days you do all your work. Remember, same thing from chapter 20. The Sabbath command is also a work command. Work for six days, seventh day is rest. And you shall cease from your labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest. Um, this idea of rest, you can read Romans 8, where it's talking about the whole earth groans, wanting to have the rest that Christ is going to come and bring. Um, in 2 Peter 3, 9, this is the Lord is not slow about his promise. Uh, but his long-suffering, wanting everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to enter into the rest. Remember, Sabbath rest was fulfilled in Christ. Rest is found. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Sabbath isn't a day of the week. It is Christ. This was pointing to Christ. Uh, however, the principle still remains needed in my life. I still need rest. Still need time of the week to focus. Um, it says now, verse 13, concerning everything which I have said to you, be on your guard and do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. Because what starts to come out of my mouth then starts to uh, lead to me acting on it. And so the idea of first thoughts, then words, then actions. Don't Use God's name in vain, and don't ever let the name of other gods even be spoken on your tongue. Because if, if, if you follow this command, you would never have to worry about idolatry becoming a problem in your family. If you never even spoke the name of other gods. Um, so it, it's almost as if we were on a car, in a car, driving down a mountain road, um, and there's a, a, a hundred foot drop off on this side. Well, we got two options. We can say, how close to the edge can I get or how far away can I stay? And what God's saying is, stay as far away from idolatry as you can because it will be the thing, and it was, that destroyed them. Verse 14 through 19 is going to talk about the different feasts. Three times. So three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. We've got the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which we've already talked about is connected with Passover. And we've got the Feast of the First Fruits. And we've got the Feast of um, Pentecost, or what's here described as the ingathering. And so uh, we're going to talk more about these feasts when we get into Leviticus. Here he just lays out um, things that we already know. We've already talked about Passover and getting the leaven out of your house for seven days. Uh, that the Passover was describing justification and then this is a form of picture of future sanctification, getting the leaven out of your house. The first fruit feast was uh, an exercise of faith in God being the provider. That uh, the first cut, the best of the first fruits that the earth produced, we're going to set apart and give to God, which would, we're going to see later on, provide um, food for uh, the, the Levitical class, the tribe of Levi. 
And then we've got the, the Pentecost um, feast, and we'll talk more about those later. It gives us some understanding in verse 18, where it says, uh, well, verse 17 says, three times a year all males shall appear before the Lord God. And there's this idea of male leadership. And we've talked a lot about this as in, in our worship services where we've gone through the book of 1 Timothy. And especially in 1 Timothy 2, where he states that he wants the men to lead the church and he wants the women to take a step back. Why is that? Well, naturally speaking, women want to step forward and lead and men want to naturally take a step back and God wants to do something supernatural so that when people look at what's happening, it's like, man, God is doing this. And you find this true all over the world is that uh, the purveyors of religion and the people that keep the family kind of in line are women, not men. And God wants to work through men being totally convinced and accountable to God. And so the idea that Moses was God's representative to Israel, God wants the husband and the father to be God's representative in the family, um, to, to lead them, to show them what God is saying and, and, and the direction God wants the family to go. Um, verse 18, it gives some uh, more stipulations about uh the Feast of Unleavened Bread and about the sacrifice. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the fat of my feast to remain overnight until morning. It's a total sacrifice. Total. Uh, you should bring the choice first fruits. Uh, we've already talked about that. The last part of verse 19 says, You are not to boil a young goat in the milk of his mother. This was a Canaanite fertility rite um, that they would do. Um, kind of bizarre. And the idea was not to associate with pagan religions. Um, it's interesting how it has evolved over the years to the point today where if I am an Orthodox Jew, I would not be allowed to eat. Even if the cheese were kosher and the hamburger were, cho or were kosher, if you put the two together, I wouldn't be able to eat it because it's milk and beef together. So um, even uh, just think through that, how we, we have taken literal things that God wants to take spiritual and we've spiritualized things that God wants us to make literal. So just think through that. We get to verse 20. Verse 20 is the fact that God is sharing, a promise that God is sharing with Israel that if they would have grabbed a hold of, they would not have died in the wilderness, and they would not have had to wander for 40 plus years. It says, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. I'm going to bring you there. God promised it straight up. You're going to have success. What an awesome promise. But then he says this, Be on your guard before my angel. And obey what? His voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. Interesting thought here. We do not know the names of very many angels. Uh, let's say we know the, the name of four angels. We know that Lucifer was an angel. Um... The word Lucifer means morning star. God's name is not in that name. However, we know that Michael is an angel, an archangel. El, at the end of Mike El, is Elohim. Uh, so El, or, or God. God is there. We also know that Gabriel, El, God, in his name. Um, but that's not who is speaking here. This angel here is none other than a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus. And how do we know that? Because the Word. The Word is going to come from him. Jesus is the Word. Look what it says. 
But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and my adversaries to your, I will be an adversary to your adversaries. So God's word is coming from him. Um, just go with me to John 14. John 14. Very familiar text. John 14 says this. I do not want your hearts to be troubled. Believe in God, Jesus says to his disciples. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Um, now we know that Thomas came back and said, we don't know. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The idea here is that Jesus is leading us to where we need to go. The same picture is here. Jesus is leading Israel where they need to go. All they need to do is obey his word. He, um, he, he talks about the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and he says, I will, I will completely destroy them. Who's going to destroy them? God's going to. But... It's not going to be the way that God did it with the Red Sea, where they just watch in silence. They're going to have to fight, but God's going to have to uh, be the one that gives them power. He's already done that once, and he'll do it again. Uh, you shall not worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars and pieces but you shall serve the lord your god he will bless your bread and your waters and he will remove sickness from your midst there th nobody's going to miscarry nobody's going to be barren in your lands i will fulfill the number of your days i'm going to take care of you just don't get involved with worshiping the gods of the people that i'm sending you to but guess what they did Exactly that. Verse 27, I will send my terror ahead of you. Let's go over to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, where this is actually being fulfilled. Verse 11 says this, When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. So um, this is in Jericho. So this happened. Uh, look down here. It says, um, and I'm going to throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you, meaning they're going to run away from you. And I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites. I'm going to use natural, supernatural phenomenons. Uh, look with me at Joshua 24. Joshua 24. In verse 2, it says this, Joshua said to the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the rivers, uh, namely uh, Terah, Nahor, um, no. Nope, I missed it. No, 24.12, I'm sorry, not 2. Look over at 24.12, it says, Then I sent the hornets before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites before you, but not uh, by your sword or by your bow. So what we see is fulfillment of what God is promising. And what we see the problem with Israel is that God partially fulfilled certain things, and he's wanting them to continue in faith to continue to grow, that if God did this in the past, if God brought us out of Egypt, then when we're standing in front of the Red Sea, God can take care of the Red Sea. And he did. But they, they grumbled and complained. But once they get on the other side of the Red Sea and, and all of Pharaoh's army is dead, God wants them to move forward the next time and trust him. So they go on, and there, now there's no water. What do they do? Instead of believing God, they start to grumble and complain. Well, then God provides them water at Marah, and the idea is that next, when they're faced with the next thing, that they would trust God because of what God has done in the past. They would grow in their faith. But what do we find out? 
no food, they start grumbling, complaining. God provides manna. God provides quail in hopes that they would grow in their faith. So then when they're without water, uh, uh, they would, at Horeb, they would trust God. But they don't. They grumble and complain. And we're going to see this pattern all the way through Israel's history. Is they never grow in faith to the point that they come to Kadesh Barnea. And God wants them to go into the promised land. And they take a vote and say, no, we're not going. And God says, well, the whole generation has to die. Um, verse 29 here says, I will not drive them out before you in a single year. Later in verse 30, he states that he's going to, to clean out the promised land little by little. Because this is what God wants. He wants them to grow in their faith. And there was not enough people in the nation of Israel to spread out all over the vast land and the, the land that was cultivated would become uh, you know, wilderness again. So God's going to do it little by little and what we're going to find out is he describes uh, verses 31 the vast you can look at the map the vast amount of land that God wants to give Israel as a possession, they never, I think Solomon is the one that gets closest to it, but they never fulfill this. Never. Um, they never truly enter into God's rest. Uh, the book of Hebrews is going to use this as an illustration to every one of us who are born-again believers. That you can be saved and really never enter into God's rest, which is... You say, well, what does that mean? Well... Let's put it like this. God may grant us certain things, but we must possess it. Okay, so God's going to do certain things, but we've got to act in faith on what he said and carry it out. Um, that's what he's doing here. Uh, they never truly stepped into that. Let, let's, let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 states this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Um, he's, and look what it says. In the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose Christ, chose no, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him uh, in love. So he's granted to us these spiritual blessings. And that means that they're there at my disposal. Yet, if I never walk in conviction, confession, and repentance, and I never willingly, through God's Spirit, humble myself, I'm never going to actually enjoy those blessings. Even though they're there, it's almost the fact of, if I'm a born-again Christian, be like a homeless person living on scraps from the dumpster when I've got millions and millions and millions of dollars in the bank, yet I, I don't ever tap into it. I challenge you in your walk with the Lord. Submit to God. Submit to God's way. Grow in Him, and you will get to know Him, which is the joy of life. It is truly what eternal life is, getting to know God. Get to know Him. Verse 32, you shall make no covenant with the, 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 or, or with their God. They shall not live in your land because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a trap or a snare to you. We're going to see in Joshua 9 that that is actually what happened. Remember, what God says will happen, will happen. God's plan cannot be thwarted. The question is, I'm going to be part of God's plan. And I'm a, am I going to be a willing participant who have willingly submitting to God or am I going to continue to rebel against him? I can ask that of myself and examine myself. I hope that you are examining yourself. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your character on display. Uh, may we Take your word and eat it. May it become part of us. May it become implanted in us. So that when we think, 
We won't be operating in our own understanding, but we will be operating in your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.